there. Hello, everybody. Hi. You've got Natasha and Skittles here, and we, um, this is an idea we've had for a while talking about coaching. We're hoping to get some more of the Tyro coaches on, both Skittles and I are team coaches. And then Torque is one of the special coaches, specialist coaches. Torque is also with us today. Um, and we we um, wanted to use the coaches corner to kind of talk about, you know, the things that maybe we don't always get to talk about in Echo. Um, uh, specifically today, we had in uh, Tyro, we had Kudakai asking about how to coach, how to teach. And both Skittles and I have a uh, background in that subject. And so uh, that was the first thing we wanted to cover today. And then yeah. later, what are we going to talk uh, about? Quite a few different things. And but so for anybody that's just popping in here, um, thank you for hanging out with us today. Um, and as Tasha was mentioning, it's going to be definitely something different and new. Um, and if you have spent any time in the, uh, the coach uh, section, then you'll kind of know where we're coming from mentally. Definitely just a show to give us the opportunity to help you guys out with some of the things that honestly just comes with time when it comes to playing echo. So hopefully you will uh, enjoy the coach's corner and some of the content that we're going to, uh, to be having today and in future sessions. So we're glad to have you here and Hey, Kudukai. Hello. <laughs> hey. So the first thing I wanted to start with was uh, growth versus fixed mindset, which is, Something we talk about in education where if you're learning a new skill, you have to have kind of a growth mindset. Like um, instead of hitting that frustration block and being like, okay, I can't learn anymore. I can't get better at this. A lot of us um, maybe socialize to like, oh, if I'm not instantly good at something, it's too hard and I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, growth mindset is kind of like essential, I would say, to Echo and to gaming in general if you want to improve. Um, life in general if you want to improve. So it's thinking about when an obstacle comes, thinking about, okay, failures happen. I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to figure out, I'm going to keep working on this skill. Um, like one example for me was my shot was really crap last summer. And so I spent 15 minutes every day. And I know Skittles does way more practice than I do. But I spent 15 minutes every day and I just went into an arena by myself and I hopped from geo to geo to geo. I took shots until I made five and then I'd move to the next geo and then I'd take shots until I made five and I'd move to the next geo. And I quickly saw that reflected in my gameplay that that helped me improve how, how I threw the disc, how often I was making shots. Um, but I could have been like, Oh, I'm just not good at taking shots and, and had given up. Um, so the, the, the fixed mindset would just be like, Oh no, I'm either good at this or I'm not. So I've got to, I'm going to give up cause I'm not good. But growth mindset is the concept that uh, you 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 can build on your skills and learn to get better. And so when you're coaching or as a student, you've got to try to think of like putting those negative thoughts aside and thinking, how can I how can I improve? I can improve. Remind yourself that there's a chance for everybody to learn this game. Like we have people of all ages playing this game. Uh, we have people of all ages all over the ladder in BRML. So yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, of course. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting about that specifically, because, you know, I talk to a lot of different people, um, whether they're new or experienced or anything like that. And, you know, Tosh knows very well how many times I have been through that. I'm about to jump off of this cliff when it comes to leaving Echo in general out of frustration. I had a question in my recent um, recent session where one of uh, the academy players was like, what do we do about plateaus? And that's a huge deal, right? Because in order to have that growth mindset, unfortunately, growth is not always easy. I mean, think about it like when we were kids, right? And we were had what they called growing pains. There's a reason why it hurt. <laughs> because growth isn't always an easy path. You know, just wake up one day and you're two feet taller. Right? It happens slowly and sometimes it happens pretty fast and it's kind of painful and you're like, oh, why does everything hurt so much? Those are those growing pains. And that same kind of thing happens in Echo. So if you ever see any of us talking about this whole glass half full, um, you know, like Tasha was saying, that growth mindset, that mindset that, yes, I can achieve something. Now, granted, we might not want to have these goals that I'm going to be the number one best Echo player ever. <laughs> 
I like to be realistic. <laughs> but the point is, is that having something in your mind that says, this is a goal I want to reach, or this is a thing I want to do. Like maybe you're struggling with your shots or you're struggling with regrabs or you're struggling with comms or anything like that. And you say, I'm going to keep pushing until I bust through that plateau. Gosh, I can remember. I can remember many, many, many plateaus that I've hit and almost knocked me on my back and just kept doing a terrible job until things made sense. Um, so one of the things that the reason why we brought this one up was because of how many times people will say things like I'm bad or I can't do anything or I don't understand or I'm just this, I'm, I can't, I can't, I'm this, I'm that. That kind of mindset from even an educational perspective, like we're coming from, can really hurt your long-term uh, gains when it comes to anything, but in this scenario, when it comes to echo. So as coaches, um, if you're a coach watching, it's something that we want to support our, our students and saying, hey, these are, these are goals you can reach. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take work. But they are goals that are re uh, you know, reachable for any given person that's in the in the academy. Um, and having flexibility and an open mind is definitely a huge part about that. And not trying to do it all at once. I know a lot of the, the players get overwhelmed, but I was thinking about when I first started playing, I play Fortnite because I'm a nerd. Um, I was not good at any of those guns. I couldn't hit a snipe. I couldn't use a shotgun, anything. Well, I started with, I'm going to learn how to use an AR. Okay, I've, I've figured out the basics of an AR. Okay, now I'm going to learn how to use a sniper. You know, and figuring out, taking it piece by piece and taking it apart and realizing, like, I can get better as I go. I'm still a shit builder, but that's fine. You know, like, I have other skills. And you can compensate with those other skills if you really think about it. And then the other thing I was going to say is from, like, the perspective of the coaches, uh, one thing that when I was getting my education degree, they said for every eight or for every one negative feedback or constructive criticism, whatever you want to call it, um, you need to give eight positives. Now I was working with young kids, so you don't have that many positives to an adult, but like you need to make sure you're giving them out of boys, out of girls, out of persons, whatever. Like you need to make sure you're um, like, and the other thing is you should be building a little bit of trust with your team. Um, like that's one thing. I think that's part of why people get frustrated when people give feedback, unsolicited feedback in the arena. Um, the trust may not be there for you to give that feedback. Like maybe that person is not receptive because like they don't know that you really have their best interest at heart. Maybe you're only, maybe in their mind, your own their only thing is like you want to win this game and you don't care how I feel. You don't care if I improve. So as coaches, we need to make sure that we're giving a positive feedback. We're building trust with our players and that they. They know if they have questions or concerns, they can come to us and we're going to help them. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a huge thing of it. But Definitely. yeah, I think uh, Romeo, I'm looking at this, this in, the, in the chat and Romeo asked a question. Um, so I'll ask it to you and then I can talk about mine a little bit more. Uh, his, what was the hardest obstacle for each of you in improving? My hardest obstacle is always what others think of me. Um, I get really in my head about do others value me? Do others think I'm worth playing with? Those kinds of things. And and that that doesn't help me improve. That just makes me feel like shit. So don't. <laughs> don't like, it, you're the only person you're gonna race with is yourself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of us have that same issue. Um, even if we don't admit to it. Uh hardest obstacle for me, um, is honestly myself. I am my biggest uh, opponent uh, when it comes to everything. Uh, and I think I'm sure a lot of you watching f have probably had a moment where you got frustrated because you knew something that happened. You knew you're better than that, right? I'm better than this. I know I can make this shot. Why didn't I make it? You know, I know I can do that. Why didn't I do it? You know, so that kind of second guessing type thing like what's wrong with me why am i making mistakes that definitely is something that has been taking me a while to get over um in addition to having the right mindset because a lot of the times our mindset which is something that we'll probably talk more about in following episodes is this idea of understanding echo inside the game 
Um, it's not just take disc, put disc in goal. <laughs> There's so many other layers to it. And I know uh, even something that I've talked about in with other players while we were just kind of like in between rounds and stuff is that idea of the importance or really the lack of importance in who scores points in a game. Um, unfortunately, we come into this game, right? And the first thing that we see we don't know anybody is we go into a pub and who's the most important person in the pub the mvp right they have it from day one kind of pushed on us that the person who does the most stuff is the winner right um even though there were three other people that helped that to happen right um and even if you don't win you still have a huge part in helping your team to have a good game to have an effective game uh, to have fun <laughs> uh, so understanding that the statistics on the board are not the full story um that is those those things have taken me a little while also and the more i realize that scoring is not as important uh as helping a team helping my team to be successful things have gotten a lot better in how i view the arena and how i view where i put myself and how i vote so yeah it's definitely seeing the arena differently has been one of the obstacles that i have tried to overcome and still still doing it still trying <laughs> i totally and agree i want to jump in here on this one because this is a really good question from romeo and and i think i, I mine is a different perspective that more i i i don't want to say it more relates to the game because it all relates to the game but mine it was specifically the mental aspects of the game in terms of keeping my mind where it needed to be. And Skittles was an, an unfortunate victim w when I first started playing competitively of how badly I spiral. And when I say spiral, it, it's it's that snowball effect that you that coaches always try and, and, and avoid where something goes wrong and then something else goes wrong and then something else goes wrong and it just gets to the point where your own mind is a self-fulfilling prophecy that this is going to go badly. And um, I don't know that you can ever, if you've got that mindset, I don't know that you can ever overcome it. But with the right teammates and the right um, support, you can definitely suppress it heavily. Um, playing with Zori, playing with Tasha, um, those types of really positive teammates really help you to be able to shrug off the last play and get your mind back where it goes. And we... It, Everybody who's played this game or watched this game at the highest levels knows that a huge portion of this game is the mental aspects of it. You know, there are going to be things physically that I can't do. I have to, be, my mind has to be able to accept that. And so it, that's a, a huge obstacle for a lot of players, especially I think in our community where you do have players that are older we're not all 15 year olds that can bounce mm -hmm. around for five hours at a time no problem we have aches and pains and we just don't bend certain ways and so just accepting those limitations and learning as skit was saying learning to work within those limitations becomes key to really getting over that and and that becomes a huge plateau for a lot of players because you just can't get it out of your head that Damn it, I'm not going to be as good as, as the master players because I can't physically do it. No, but you can be as good as you can be Yeah. by just accepting that this is what you got to do. Um, had a player earlier today in Tasha's session that was asking about, should I change the way that I throw? Because physically that causes me pain, but I can't throw very hard. No, but you can throw accurate. Okay, if you can't throw an 18, don't throw an 18. But if you can throw a 15 accurately from three meters, goalie's going to have a hard time catching that. Yeah. Okay, so live, work, learn to accept that these are, this is what you can do and be the best at what you can do. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things I love the most about Echo. Um, there are a lot of things that, not just age, but physically, a lot of things I'm just not okay doing. <laughs> I can't really duck and jump very well. Bad knees. <laughs> um, and that, I'm sure some of you watching, if you're newer, there, there's, this, there's this point where you're like frustrated because you see other people doing stuff 
and you're like, I can't do that. I'm if I can't if I can't do that, then that means I'm never gonna be any good. Get that trash out of here, uh, because it's like Torque said, it's all about being able to do you as best as you can be done. Uh, so for me personally, I can't do all the jumping and weirdness and everything, but I can hit 18s all day. So that's how I score on goalies who don't expect it as opposed to a person who maybe um, is a little bit more flexible and they do a lot of dipping and jumping and then they can get into the goal or a person who is a little bit more um, able to read goalies better. There's there, You just have to find your spot, your thing. Um, and whatever that happens to be, you'll find there's a place for you to be very successful in any arena. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I think the other thing to think about, uh, is as we're coaching, we talk about, uh, welcome Italian is cute. <laughs> um, the other <laughs> thing we, what I want to talk about was like decomposition. So as we're teaching, um, like we have to reflect on what we've learned and how we learned it. Like you can bring someone in who's got a master's or a PhD in some crazy subject. They may not realize how they first learned the subject. And so as we're coaching, we want to break things down and break them down into, um, you know, like bite-sized pieces for the students to get. So like when we're teaching regrabbing, I'm not going to teach directional regrabbing immediately. I'm going to teach, okay, this is who grabs first. Okay, this is how you pull straight. Because um, those are like the two first things that like you need to teach anybody who's going to learn how to regrab. Um, so as you're going through this and as you're teaching or as, like if you're going to do coaching sessions in Tyro or anywhere else, you want to think about what are the steps to get to where I was. Because like the way I regrab now has taken a year and a half, you know, or so, maybe a little bit more. And it's taken several steps to go up that and get to there so i think it's just a real it interesting thing to think about when you're teaching new new people how to play echo that it's not just like jump in and play how i play because i've seen people do that i've seen people do that in gaming all the time where they just think well like why can't you just figure out how i'm doing it well because you've played it for two years <laughs> you yeah. know like you're just not going to come at that so um the same way yeah and then um yeah, I was just just think about how you can break it down. And I'm sure you you've done that as well. Like we don't learn a language by suddenly speaking it. We learn yeah. the basic, we learn the alphabet. You know, those kinds of things. And there's nothing wrong if you are the student, right? If you're one of the folks in the academy and your coach says something and you realize that the information they just gave you you're missing a piece. Please ask a question. Please ask them to clarify because unfortunately, you know, our your coaches are not going to be perfect, right? <laughs> None of us are. But the thing is, is that it's very hard to understand something if someone were to skip steps. Right? And maybe there are other people in there who understand it, but if you want to do it privately, that's cool. After, that's cool. If you want to do it right then and there, that's also cool. Everybody will be fine with that. But one thing you don't want to do is take information from someone and say, well, I don't really understand how I got to letter, you know, letter M because I'm missing the first half of the alphabet. Um, but I'll just, okay, I'll just take it and be fine with it. Ask for that information. Um, it's, it's, a, it's something that I was talking about a little bit um, in the server a couple of days ago. There's this education concept because I've taught teachers how to teach and also taught students English for a long time. And one of the concepts that we talk about is this one that's called the input hypothesis. And it works off of this equation called I plus one. So I is essentially everything that the person currently knows right now. Um, you know, in my scenario, when I teach English, it's me having to find out what that student actually knows. So in this scenario, it's being able to say, okay, well, everybody in the academy, everybody in your class has different understanding. They have different knowledge that they're coming with. One, I plus one, is how much more information you're going to put on top of that, that the person has to now take into their mind and kind of see how does the knowledge I know plus the knowledge you've just given me connect. I mean, it, it kind of falls into this other thing. You can't connect 
the unknown to the unknown. It doesn't work that way. You have to be able to connect what someone already knows to something they don't know, um, which is a great way to learn things in general. And it works the same way with echo too. If I wanted to teach you directional regrabbing, like Tosh said, I would have to teach you first the basics of regrabbing, and then I would have to teach you how to regrab in a straight line, and then I would have to teach you how to turn. So there's levels. Three and levels, be, yeah. Yeah, and being able to take what, I, what you know and add just a little bit, because unfortunately it's very easy for teachers to mess this up. If you've ever had a teacher who was like, okay, so we are starting this new thing and I'm gonna teach you the most complicated thing you've ever heard of in your entire life and your mind just exploded. It was done. It was like, I hate everything. I don't care. And that's how the mind works. If you get past that one section, that's one step above what you already know. This is that like out of your comfort zone, but learning area, right? I'm sure you guys know about that. The, the area where you tend to learn is just a little bit beyond what you know, right? Not too much. If you end up getting to this like 100 stage, the brain has its way of just closing down. It says, this content is too difficult. I can't even connect to anything I know. There are too many steps that are missing. I am done. So whether we are training people or whether we are learning, either way, we have to be able to stay within our own bounds of what we already know and how we can improve on what we know by adding small steps at a time. And hopefully the coaches will be able to stay within the entire session. You know, of course, everyone's abilities are different, so it can be kind of difficult, but being patient and Asking questions when things don't make sense is the number one easiest way you're going to get uh, from, you know, point A to point B. Yeah. Um, and a lot of this is I'm talking about how to how to make we're, we're the main concept we're talking about right now is how to make learning accessible for your students or people you're training or whatever. Um, and the next thing I wanted to talk about was like different sources of instruction. So like the, the players I know who play well, they do VOD reviews. They practice by themselves. They don't just go to practice with their team once in a while and call it good. Like, like some of the teenagers might be able to pull that off. Most of us adults can't. <laughs> uh, my body doesn't work that way. It's got to have muscle memory and repetition and those kinds of things. So, like, if you're able to, like, share videos, like, we've seen this in Tyro already, but, like, share videos that uh, will teach a concept. Um, like, there was a video that Tree shared to our team server when I was still on the sloth that talked. Uh, it was Phenom talking about the ping hand. That changed the way I played completely. Um, things like that can that like a lot of people think, oh, I just need to be in the arena. No, mm -hmm. you need different different ways to learn and different sources. And people access information in different ways. Yeah. Like making sure that they have, you know, some videos they can look at. You know, maybe they're sitting at work and they've got like Dimly's goalie training running in the background just so that they're thinking about it. You know, during that. Or whatever. And then the other thing that I think is really important is avoiding frustration fatigue. So if you get to that point where you're overwhelmed because the teacher just threw too much at you, or if you're just frustrated in general, like you and I have talked about this a lot, like yeah. just in our personal conversations is like, sometimes you need a break for a few days. Sometimes you need, and that's, you're still Strong. learning. Even Strongly if you take support break. breaks, yeah. Strongly support breaks. Didn't do it early on realized how badly that it how bad it is for your mind and your body to not take a break yeah yeah I always say if I don't take breaks my body will my body will take breaks for me Make and I don't get a break and I don't get to decide when that break is if my body decides my yep. body decides when that break is mm -hmm. um so like if you're if you're finding that a student's like struggling or not getting it you may need to go back to the drawing board and approach it from a different angle um like i put something like in my notes i have this could be as simple as like going into a one-on-one -on -one with the student and starting from the bottom and being like okay what what is clicking for you and what is not clicking for you where where is the disconnect like going mm -hmm. through like why and and some of it's just time too like with regrabbing when like every single one of us who's played this game did not get regrabbing instantly Every single one of us has grabbed first when they should have let the other person grab onto them. And then you're both sitting there, you know, like all of us did that for a while. It's yep. just, and you'll get there. So. Definitely. And I, I feel like that whole concept is so important to understand because, you know, we can, 
we can go in and as a as a coach we can give all this information um but one of the things i think is also really important if you are teaching someone else if you're watching this right now and you're in a, a coaching position or you are teaching someone or you're trying to help anybody you know almost anybody can be a coach at, to someone who just started right um but one of the things that's really important and this is a, a, a something i use in in uh teaching uh, english is that one of the best ways to find out whether someone actually understands a concept or has mastery over the concept is one's ability to teach a concept. So it, instead of asking someone, hey, do you understand how to re-grab? And they go, yeah, I know how to re-grab. And then you're like, okay, cool, check, that's done. Uh, maybe we ask questions about specifics of re-grabbing, right? Um, what do you do in this scenario? How do you do this? What's the best thing to do? Who should be grabbing first? What what could we do in this scenario? If a person can answer all of those questions, then of course, you know, that's that kind of like, click. Now they've shown that they can explain it to me. Right? And that's how I often do it with my students. Explain this to me. Do you understand how this, you know, tense or conjugation works? If they can explain it to me, then I am confident in their answer. The answer, yes, I know how to do that, is not always actually true. <laughs> um, sometimes we overassess what we what we know about something that's very simple. Um, so yeah, keep that one in mind. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And uh, you had already kind of covered it, but we were talking about like differentiating instruction and like talking to students. Like I, we had a practice today with my my academy students, and I pulled a few of them aside, and I'm like, okay, how long have you been playing? have you played a lot of privates? Do you play more pubs than privates? Like what, where are you at in terms of skills? So I can make sure that I'm teaching them where they're at, not where I want them to be. Um, that's super important. Like it's just hugely important. Um, and then I was just going to look, um, and like, you can do things like split, split your students into groups. That's what we did today. I had three coaches in the room. So like, some of us spent some time with a student who was newer and then I went with some of the other students and was like, okay, what do you want to focus on? Cause I know you have some of these basics down already. So where, where do you feel like you have holes? What can I help you with? Like, uh, and then I t showed them some drills to work on their shooting. Cause that was what they were like interested in at that moment. Um, and it's just basic drill. It's the geo drill where you pop around geo and take those shots. Um, but you know, small things, small movements can really help you. Um, Small drills can help you because you're building that muscle memory. So, yeah, I mean, solo drills can help a lot of people improve their shot. There's solo drills to help you read disc, things like that. So, definitely. I think we have something set up here. Torque, you want to talk to us about this? Ah, uh, good segue. Yep. Yeah, so we did. We promised we'd talk a little bit about. Um, the theory of coaching and, and learning and teaching, which I will definitely defer to um, Tasha and Skittles on that because, you know, they are actually accredited experts on that stuff. And I've just been coaching for about 30 years. So um, what I will go into is we've also promised everybody a little bit of content as far as the in game. So I'm going to transition us over into our favorite replay viewer back to what we were t they were saying before uh, i think it was tasha was saying before about um the use of video reviews replay files for spark if you don't have spark installed on a computer in your house install it the the ability to look at a replay file gives you a tremendous amount of information not only as you for you as an individual and and things that you're doing and habits that you have but also how your team is performing you know you can look and see that there's just certain things your team is doing that hey that's not going to work or that we do that all the time and it never works um you you know give you an example new teams they love to do um they love to go and do those those pub splits and throw deep into the tunnels and inevitably 70 percent of the time that disc bounces off the wall of the tunnel the back stack picks it up and you just gave the the joust away you know, those types of mistakes and not thinking um, is is part of the fundamental understanding of the game, okay? It's not physically what you can do. It's not, hey, I'm, you know, 15 and can bend over backwards like the Matrix. 
it's the understanding of the strategy behind the game. So what I wanted to do for the new players was specifically to talk about um, bubble defense strategy. Because, you know, everybody who I've coached and everybody who plays with me knows I love defense. It is the most underplayed skill in Echo. So I want to start off. You can see I've got the, the replay viewer up and kind of hovering over the bubble here. Now, the bubble, a lot of teams play a lot of uh, bubble defense a, a different ways. If you've got a solid team, you can play man-to-man -man in the bubble. Absolutely. But the, the drawback to playing man-to-man -man defense is, of course, everybody on your team has to be an outstanding defender. If one person gets beat in man-to-man, -man, your defense got beat, right? It's just that simple. And with how jukey some players are, some players are just more difficult to defend man-to-man. -man, so it's a harder defense for newer players to learn and be able to effectively adopt. And we don't want you to get discouraged by it. So for the academy, um, I'm going to be teaching some more zone-based and passing lane-based uh, bubble defenses. And the, the primary one that I teach most teams is what I call a triangle in one, okay? And it's the basic idea of you have a striker, a striker, and a goalie, right? They form the triangle, and that triangle stays intact at all times, okay? If the disc is in the middle of the field, this is the basis for their formation, is that triangle. Your midfielder is up here at nest. Your midfielder is your pressure guy that's going to go press the disc outside of the bubble, right? But everybody else is going to stay home and be disciplined and stay in the bubble. If the disc goes over here to the left side, then your left striker is going to move from shield over to post. Your right striker is going to move from the side of shield over to the middle of shield so they can cover nest, floor, or shield. Your goalie is still at home, right? So in that instance, you've still maintained your triangle. Now, why is the triangle important? And triangle is important because if the disc is here, right, the midfielder is chasing back and forth trying to put pressure on the disc holder. If the, if the disc is here, this striker is covering anybody that comes down here to the wall Anybody that comes up here to shoulder, anybody that comes to boot, right? It's their zone. This entire area is this striker's zone to cover, all right? The backside striker is the one, and this is exactly where a lot of newer teams fail. And even, honestly, if we watch teams all the way up into the diamond range, they fail at this quite frequently. And that's they're vulnerable to the cut pass. Because this backside striker does not drop back to cut off that cut pass. That's what his sole responsibility is to protect the goalie's blind side. Like a left tackle in football, right? His job is to protect that blind side so that the goalie can focus on stopping any shots that are coming from this side where the disc is at. And so maintaining that discipline to stay home is one of the key mental aspects of the game all too often players especially newer players get into this mindset and they're oh i gotta move i gotta move i gotta constantly be moving in bubble defense no you gotta constantly be cutting off passing lanes right if this striker is here and this striker is here right the disc is out here goalies in goal regardless of where the midfielder is at if the disc is over here at Ghost, your passing lane options are very limited with this striker here because he can cut this passing lane off, right? He can cut a shot off. This striker, if you choose to go all the way across, then the backside striker, it can cut that off. So keep that in mind when you're playing bubble defense is that don't move around so much. Don't chase the disc. You don't need to. You need to be reading where the passing lanes are. The goalie should be in there communicating and controlling everything to tell you, hey, I've got a guy down on the floor. I've got a guy up on right shoulder. I've got somebody at clock, 
right? All, the goalie should be communicating where the offensive players are the whole time. So you can hear while you're seeing what's going on. If the goalie is telling you there's somebody at logo and you're this middle striker, you should probably be on the bottom of shield, not on the top of shield, right? Top of shield, you're farther away. Get down to the bottom of shield. If they throw a pass down to logo, you're there. Same thing with shoulder. This striker that's over here, if there's a, the goalie calls out that there's somebody at left shoulder, you move up to the edge of shoulder and you block those passing lanes. You're not trying to get into a brawl with the guy. If you get into a brawl in, in <clears throat> if you get into a brawl in the bubble, chances are you're going to cost your team points, right? Because offensive players can become unstunned and be invulnerable for two seconds in the bubble. If they're invulnerable for two seconds. You just gave them, I mean, even Martini can dunk if he's un, invulnerable. Right, Martini? I see you there in chat. Um, triangle defense feels aggressive. No. Um, you all, Yes, you always have someone pushing the disc. And that's the intent, okay? Um, the intent is to keep the pressure on. But remember that that midfielder that's moving around here back and forth the midfielder's pressure can dictate to the team, the, to the offense, what they do with the disc, right? You don't have to go and try and steal the disc. If I just apply the pressure and force that offensive player to go farther out wide, just doing that, you're taking away passing lanes, right? So if you, if you know that your strongest defender of your two strikers is this guy over here on post, then why wouldn't you, if you're the midfielder, don't go with the guy with the disc directly. Go more towards Trench and force him to go that way. He's not going to juke into you most of the time, right? It's not going to happen. He's going to try and make that space so that he has those passing lanes. Recognizing what they're trying to do and what your defense is trying to do and making them go into positions that is less advantageous for them is what you want. If you know a team loves to go clock, having your goalie play more towards the top of the rim so that they can intercept those clock passes becomes pivotal. If you take away what they're good at, then they have to rely on what they're not good at. So that's the idea of bubble defense. Now, I have a separate replay from a training session that I want to bring up specifically to, talk, to demonstrate that backside striker. And in this instance, I happen to be the backside striker. If we, as I roll through this, you'll see they have a, they have a striker over here, BT Blackhawk, right? They've got the disc. They're going to the opposite side. I'm, BT doesn't move, so I'm staying to make sure that he stays covered in this instance. Now watch, I always talk in my defensive sessions about making sure that you make the offensive player commit to open space before you come off of your anchor, right? Don't let him get you caught out in no man's land. Now watch BT. He's left. I see he's left. I'm waiting. I'm jumping. I'm grabbing. Just by grabbing him and stunning him there, I've taken away the cut pass right as the defender that's on that side, on the strong side, is engaging the, the shooter. The shooter has no decent option at that point, right? He can't, because he went behind Geo, he took Nest away from him. I took away his backside. All he can do is loft it in towards the backboard. The goalie grabs it, gets it out of there. That's what we want to see from those backside strikers. You have to be disciplined enough to engage him and keep him from being a viable target. If I don't grab him here, right, if I dive towards the disc holder instead, that is the cut pass that we see 100,000 times in, in league matches every day, right? I mean, I, I would argue that 60 to 70% of the goals scored in league matches are on cut passes because teams don't cover the backside, right? And it's really as simple as what this looks like. You don't have to try hard to do it. You just have to be disciplined enough to stay home and trust your teammates. Here, I'm trusting my teammate on the far side that he's going to engage. I'm trusting my goalie that he is, if these guys get the disc, if by chance he throws that, that nest pass, that the goalie is going to challenge him, right? 
and I'm doing my job taking away this backside. Martini has a question for you. In that scenario, do you then jump for the second potential cut pass from Nez or hold on to the first person? It depends on the situation. You knew, you know that, Martini. Defense is always situational. But you'll notice in the replay, what did I do? As soon as I stunned him out, I stayed with him, right? I'm still with him. I'm still with him. I'm still with him. Until the disc is loose, then I come off because I'm looking to try and get a stack together back there with the goalie course the goalie went the other direction left left me without a stack but i was trying to close the gap to get the stack together as quickly as possible okay but yes no you, i what you're saying what you're asking about is correct but you'll notice as soon as i stun him i'm still holding him until i see the disc is loose he can't throw a cut pass here he doesn't have the disc in his hand anymore right so at that point, I no longer have to. Up until that point, I was kind of using a something I learned from Khan a long time ago. And I'm using the opponent as an anchor. He stunned out. He's essentially a Geo sitting there in the bubble. So I can hang out on him. And if they try to throw a late cut pass here, yes, then I can just simply dive straight off of him and engage the cutter from Nest. I'm able to cover both of those on the backside simply by doing that. And in this particular instance of this drill, you notice we didn't have a midfielder here, right? We were just focused on what the two strikers were doing in this particular drill. If the midfielder had been there, then the midfielder should have been coming up and either applying double pressure or coming back to nest and covering this guy anyway. So Martini says it's hard for me with defense sometimes to go proactive or waiting till something happens and you know one of the things i hate about <laughs> when someone asks when there, someone says something or asks questions is that it all depends answer i hate that answer but it's it's definitely a true one you know i mean um it's like playing back stack what's better aggressive or passive it, it depends, depends. <laughs> it depends because sometimes aggressive leaves you wide open for threes and they'll they'll destroy you all day sometimes passive keeps you too far back to the point where you're literally just letting them get into the bubble every time and their chances of scoring are really high so you know there there are situational issues with those and eh, you know i think as long as we are trying to keep in mind that there's more there's more to defending than simply grabbing the person holding the disc and stunning them or grabbing the disc from them there you know there's one person can do that well, what are the other three people going to do well one's maybe in the in the goal what are the other two people going to do to be useful to the play as a whole and sometimes it's not the first thing you think it is Oftentimes, just positioning in the right place to scare people, like Turk was saying, into going in directions that's uncomfortable for them, which also makes it harder for them to score. Or throwing in, or or taking away, even if you're not in between, in the middle of a passing lane, being present enough to where the person with the disc second guesses that pass, that's still just as effective. I mean, we all know the time that you get to think in. Uh, in echo is is you know seconds if you're lucky you get seconds to think before you have to do something if you see that it looks like somebody's covered most of the time you're not going to try and force that pass right so you don't have to be in the perfect position you just have to be in a position that the person with the disc can see you and second guess going there um I think the other thing about that is, Martini, is a lot of players get stuck in their mindset that they play defense one way. Just like you have many, many different offensive rollouts, you have many, many, many different defensive rollouts and different bubble looks that you can throw. The triangle is just one of the bubble defenses that you can throw out there. And knowing when to use each one and knowing how we, how that's going to affect the the as the play develops also becomes part of that skill set the i think the triangle in my opinion is a solid defense to run most of the time however like skit said 
that does put three of your players at a very fairly passive stance and you only have one there are times when you want to run that 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 front stack in bubble defense and have them zipping around putting pressure on every single throw that's made it's just situational as to who's got the disc what you know about that other team and how they play all of that i see constantly all the way up and even in the master tier you see teams that try and go out and run uh, that that stack defense on bubble and they want that stack zipping all over the place the problem is they go against a team like avant who is exceptionally good at pinpoint passes with velocity and spreading the defense out so going out of the bubble you're just helping them that's what they want you to do. They want you to spread out so that they can get that cut and you, there's open passing and shot lanes. So sometimes using that front stack to put pressure is good. And sometimes you need to, to take the foot off of the pedal and force them into making a mistake. Right? And, and Go ahead, Skit. And I feel like the, there are... A good thing to keep keep in mind with the multiple different strategies that come from defensive or offensive is you can find complexity within uh, simplicity. So for example, many uh, um, advanced teams, some of the top tier teams will use a variation of the pub split in order to adapt the way that they play um, in order to get the disc down the field. Uh, so it's not just saying, Oh well, this one choice that you made. This is this is a this kind of strategy, and it's too easy for once you get to this level. Well, it's not really about something being too easy. It's about some, knowing the basics and how to turn simplistic movements and plays and positioning into more complex ones. Because at some point you're gonna do a pub split, and it's gonna stop working, and then you're going to adapt either singular locations of where people's bodies are. For example, when we were very very beginning floated into the tunnels and we caught the disc and then as we went up a little bit we realized this is not a good idea because someone keeps stunning me every time i catch the disc or before i catch the disc so then you adapted that a little bit and then you decided okay well here is maybe a better idea of stopping before i get to the tunnel and holding on to the side so that i have more control then you figure okay well that's not working either even these types of changes can happen mid-game but really if we're thinking about leveling up from you know bronze and up you're adapting the simple things you know to become more complex as complexity is needed according to the level that you actually play at yeah absolutely yep. and, and i think that that the the problem is is that players especially the top tier players very often top tier players are not good coaches because in their minds, that simplicity is there. If you watch them and really break it down, like you said, it becomes incredibly complex. And so trying to explain something that is actually extremely complex to somebody who just it just comes naturally to because they've done it for so long, they're thinking, hey, this is super easy, just do this. But it's not that easy. Running an effective stack breaker, the ace play is another one, that running that effectively requires a lot of practice and a lot of skill if you try and get a, a bronze silver or gold team to try and run that play they're going to fail most of the time it's just not that easy but you may be able to do it yourself but can you break it down again to those small digestible bites so that a brand new player in, in the academy we have players that literally they finished the tutorial on Monday of this week. Yeah. Okay. Can I explain to that person how to run an ace play effectively? That's Not, <laughs> and again, there is, a, that, that's why I, I, I always get a little bit on tilt about when, when the top players talk about you can't coach if you're not diamond or, or, or master. It's a different mindset. You just need to understand the game to teach the game. You don't have to physically be yeah. able to do I think it's it. a different skill set. Like that's the it thing is. that people don't realize is like Serena Williams and Venus Williams, like their dad was not the top tennis player in the world. He still coached some of the best tennis players like arguably the best like 
arguably two of the best tennis players ever to exist. Like, um, coaching is not the same skill set as playing. Um, and I think that that's something I really like to point out that like a good coach does not have to be the best person at the game. They just have to have a deep understanding of the game. And especially at our level where a lot of our players are newer, like we just have to understand this is what the basics are and really show them and help bring them up to our level. Like that's really what we're going for. I mean, is, even our, our coaching staff, yeah. you can talk about that. Our coaching staff is not, there are some people on our coaching staff that are, have been playing a shorter amount of time. Um, but you know, it's, that's the nice part about being able to have the academy within Tyro. It's about helping people, right? It's about helping people who need help. Technically, if you've been playing for 10 days, you could probably help someone who's been playing for one day. What have I learned in the past 10 days? Let me tell you, here are some things that you can get caught up with in that one day, right? And, um, and, and, and our coaching staff varies. We, our two head coaches are both master tier or master skill level players. Abchu hasn't quite broken through on, on the Ch Challenger Cups, although he's had numerous attempts. And obviously Hunter has been master. So, um, you know, we have coaches that are at the top tier of skill. And then we have coaches like me. I'm just a bronzy and I'll probably be a bronzy forever. So, you know. He's not a bronzy. For those of you who are new to the channel. That's a lie. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if you're a bronzy or not. Like, I, I think... I think we sometimes get so fixated on rank that we don't give a we it it becomes a barrier for learning. Absolutely. Like yeah, yeah, I just see people get so stuck on that that it's a barrier for learning. Like if even if you're your team silver and you like this season there may be things that someone who's played 2 years ago or for 2 years and their team silver that they could teach you that you wouldn't know if you've only been playing for 3 months. Like there's just the the reality is time and investment is a big thing. And, and, and like, I know Torque does, Torque spends a ton of time picking apart plays and playing with these students. So like, I don't know anybody else who spends that much time doing VOD reviews with people. Oh, I love um, analyzing plays. Yeah. And so like <laughs> Torque is going to, I trust that Torque has an eye for VOD review that I don't know anybody else has that eye right now that I'm close with at least. So I, I think yeah. that, and yeah. I think VOD reviews back to my statement, I can't say it enough. VOD reviews and the replay files in particular that Spark generates are such a helpful learning tool for newer players and even for teams because you you don't see things in the moment, right? Even the best players don't see everything that's going on at all times in the moment. And the ability to take the adrenaline and everything out of the discussion and to be able to look at it analytically and slow it down frame by frame and say, okay, right here, you made the decision to attack a bad bubble when you had all the information in front of you, you just didn't process it fast enough, right? So if you're, why would you do a one-on-four here? You're not likely to win that. And that's at any level, a one-on-four is not a winning proposition, right? Whether it's bronze or master, you're not likely to win a one-on-four, right? So it's, it's those decision points that I like to focus on with those players to say, what were you thinking? And it's not a, hey, you shouldn't have done this. If you've been in any of my reviews, you, you are definitely familiar with me asking, what were you thinking? Because what you're thinking in the moment dictated the action you took next. And I'm questioning the validity of the action you took next. Right? Right? So I think that's, from a coaching perspective, that's a critical way of approaching it because you need those tools to be able to show a player. In the moment, it felt like they were doing the right thing. But in actuality, when you take all of the emotion and the passion and the adrenaline out of it and show them, look, this is a very low percentage choice that you made. What you could have done is this. And oh, by the way, had you take, gotten that, you know, if you'd backed it out, did a reset, whatever, you would have seen immediately that, hey, we had a wide open three on the other side of the, the arena. But you didn't see it because you were caught up in the moment, right? And that kind of goes back to what Martini is saying um, about that, that, that sense of urgency and, and sometimes stopping and taking a moment. I'm a huge fan and I think it's proven time and time again, Joker did it, then Ignite did it, and the top master teams are still doing it, 
is that they reset the disc more than anybody on the planet. No other teams do as many resets and, and lateral passes in the arena than those top master teams. And that's what makes them good because they're able to slow the game down, get a little bit more time. I mean, they're playing at the fastest pace of anybody. And yet they're still able to slow it down just enough to be able for, for them to process what's happening and to execute the next option, right? So for the, the academy players, I think that's important is understanding that don't you don't have to go full speed all the time. It doesn't have to be go, 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 clear and chase. Whoever's the fastest stack wins, okay? In actuality, the easiest way to counter the fast stacks is to slow it down and take that away from them, you know? A stack breaker offense is highly effective if you know how to execute it. Agreed. Definitely. I think most things fall into that category. Things are very effective if you know how to do them right. <laughs> well, and that's what the academy is here for, is to, to help people understand how to do them. Yeah, um, started from the bottom, going through the fundamentals, and just trying to make sure that not only the coaching is effective, and appropriate, but also the learning process uh, streamlined and makes sense, is logical, right? We can't necessarily, we can teach some things like you, like from master that we can learn from, from up at the top, but there are also some things we gotta, we gotta crawl first before we can run. Absolutely. And that's what we're doing, getting the crawling yeah. part out of the way. <laughs> well, and I think that that's, sometimes people forget like masters, like they're amazing guild athletes, but like a lot of the, a lot of, people who play echo are not master level players. So it's more teaching the individual and less teaching everybody to be master because not, a, yeah. not everybody has the potential to be master. If I'm being yeah. honest, I don't think I have the potential to be, you know, master player, but um, some people just want to be decent at the well, game and, like, yeah, and be able to have fun and, and accomplish success in some fashion. Um, and that is something I think everyone can do. Finding yeah, that, success through echo. That was one of my main like motivations as we were going was um, I wanted to maintain a level of play that I could continue to play with my friends. And um, and I think team play. So I'm subbing this season. And one thing I've noticed that I do miss is like that coordinated chemistry team play. And I think that that's one thing that like the Academy last season really got to work on was even as newer players joined. Um, like my team had several newer players and they went, they were like, they came in second, but we had people join right up to like when we went to finals. And I think for them, it was still fun, like to build that chemistry and learn how to play together. I, I mean, think part of when, this. You first, when you first get to the point where you realize that you can actually take a half court shot and make it most of the time, there's not, nothing feels as good as just do it, taking your shot, right? And yeah. you know that it took you a little while to get there, um, but it felt good. Some of it was a little harder than others, uh, but you got to that point because you didn't give up. <clears throat> and hopefully that's what we're gonna see uh, within this academy and in the past. I uh, see Kudukai just put some stuff in there. When I joined Tyro, <laughs> He's all giving I wanted me a hard to do time. was not be a perma goalie. <laughs> as if you don't give as good as you get. So yeah, I think it's unrealistic. <laughs> Come hell or high water, Kudika, you will not be a perma goalie by the time the academy season is over, okay? Well, I remember one of my first things was I met like a 14-year-old kid who plays um who played uh who played VRML and was talking at VRML when I first met him when I was playing. And he was like, Well, let tell me how many threes you've you've made and blah blah blah. And he was making me like run all my stats up with him. And like my stats were shit because I'd maybe played pups for two months. You know, like they weren't good. I hadn't made many threes. Um, I've certainly made a lot more threes since then. And like the other thing, we talked about this uh, when we were casting the other day, that like threes are not the most important mechanic of the game. If I can get five twos versus one three, guess which one just won? You know, the two the the, the two pointers. You know, and in basketball, which has a very similar mechanic for scoring, like being. Um, being able to score a bunch of, you know, two shot points is what drives you up the <coughs> scoreboard and gets you winning. So being able to keep control of the disc. You know, a lot of the times threes turn into turnovers. Um yeah. and you know, people get excited. Ooh, goal, yay, I could possibly make it. And realistically they're not ready for it. So hopefully that also comes across 
in the academy. At least that's what I'm hoping with my team is to be able to help everyone understand that some things are currently within your grasp and some things are outside of your grasp. It doesn't mean you can't get to them eventually, but there, there's, there's steps, right? You cannot go from floor one to floor two in one step. You and even what, steps. when you have, yeah, even when you have the mechanics down, we've talked about this a lot. Arena sense comes with time in the arena. So like you can have good mechanics and you're still not able to watch everyone around you because you just haven't spent enough time playing those games and building that skill. Cause that's a skill you can only build by playing. You can't build it by, I mean, I've, I've seen people get like the react thing and I think that does help. But like, I think I didn't get react until like two weeks ago. Um, and I can, I know I have a better idea just from playing where people are watching my teammates, watching opponents, trying to count where everyone is four players in front of me, three players to my side, like, you know, those kinds of things. I think... For anyone who is wondering what she's talking about, I think it's spelled like this, R-E-A-K-T. Yes. Yep. Um, and that is a, a game that some people have used uh, in order to improve their game sense in, for being in goal. Um, it really just does improve reaction time. Uh, it's, not echo re it's not echo related, but it does seem to have some positive effects for those who play in the goal. Um, and so it's a, an interesting app. Yeah. Yeah, and I think going back to what you were saying about step one to step two, Skit, I think it, it for the Academy players in particular, I think it's very important because I know we've had Academy Season 1 players that have gotten a little frustrated when they took the, the jump into competitive play, right? Keep in mind, if we're talking about VRML, you're talking about a league with more than 6,000 active players. Being bronze means you're somewhere in the bottom 40% 40 yeah. of that. That's a lot of people. So <laughs> if you are the best bronze player, like me, you're still better than close to 3,000 players at this game in the competitive arena. Okay? Getting to silver... Then now you're get, you're getting up to closer to the seventy percent mark where, that makes up just bronze and silver. Okay, I know the master players like to get into a contest, a measuring contest about I'm master and you're just diamond. But at that point, you're talking about tenths of a percentage of the best players on the planet. Would it be cool to be diamond? Sure. The amount of time it takes and the effort it takes. To get that good. The reason that those players are Diamond and Master. Is because they've been playing the game. Since it was released in 2017. Okay. Yeah, and um, some of them even just, the newer I, Master I mean, players. Just, yeah. Even the newer Master players. Have been playing two to three years. To get to that. And they're playing every single day after school. They, they're they not grown ups. That have responsibilities. You know. So. It's. Keep in your mind that if you want to set a goal for, I want to be a gold player, that is a great goal. Don't let yourself get caught into, I want to be a gold player before the end of this current season. Okay. Although we do have one of the academy teams from season one that is, I think, silver three or silver four. So they are very, very close halfway through the season to actually getting to into a gold star which is nice. incredibly impressive, if you ask me, because Skittles and I went through some trials long before we got up to that level. <laughs> Still going through trials, Tori. <laughs> yeah, <Always>. I know. <laughs> so, anyway. um, before we wrap it up, I want to kind of open the floor up a little bit to anybody in the chat. Did any of the Academy players or anyone else in the chat have any questions that they want to ask the coaches? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, we will be doing... At least until next time. <laughs> right now it won't be a weekly show yet, but we will be doing more Coach's Corners going forward um, in uh, here on VRBN so that we can cover in more detail. We'd like to do more of those types of uh, instructional segments where we can go through different parts of the Tyro Academy syllabus and and talk about the, the pitfalls for improving in those specific areas. Um, so that is definitely coming up. 
Um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, obviously all of us are extremely busy. All of us are coaching at least one team and I have three right now. So, um, there will be three academy teams that know how to play defense come time for the, the round robin and the finals. I promise that. <laughs> yeah, I think rise, you can, you can, if you're, if you're that skilled of a player, you can find, like, just offer it up an Echo, and you can find teams that are willing to coach. You can't do the I, – I don't think you can participate in the academy because you're not old enough, but, um, like, Tyro uh, – yeah, we all – we're partnering with Tyro to do the coaching. So, and Tyro is yeah. an adult community. But, it like, you can find – I like, when when I played, I think all of us have worked with coaches when we played in VRML where we just found someone who was um, – someone that would work with us and teach us some of the drills or some of the concepts they were working on. So I have coached several teams in VRML over the years now. Yeah. And I'm very proud. I actually now have a, a diamond player that I coach defensively. So that's my feather in my cap now. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. Well, if we've got no other questions, um, yeah then I think I will turn it back over to the two of you to, to wrap us up and we will outro out. Nice. Outro out. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate everybody being here. Um, and it has been really nice to have participation in chat and we uh, appreciate your support and hopefully you'll tune in next time that we have anything on the BRBN. So if you are not yet uh, following the channel, go ahead there and hit that little heart button and go ahead and follow us so that you'll get alerted when we're going to be on remember we are going to be having a lot of content obviously a lot of academy content coming up uh vrml games casting those right now uh so if you want your vrml game to get cast definitely join the discord for vrbn and uh thank you for hanging out with us we appreciate that and don't forget oh. mythical rainbow gaming coming back for a new episode soon? Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to uh, get lost again in Portal and Here... click, click the wrong buttons. <laughs> Here's the link. Uh, I just threw it in chat if you'd like to join us in VRBN. And uh, we do accept tickets for VRML casting if you would like to have your game casted. So, yep. And it's easy to figure out. It'll be in there if you get into the into the Discord. Yeah. It's all very self-explanatory. So. Oh, wait, did I? I might have been invited to the wrong Discord. I might have been in the wrong place. One second. <laughs> it's okay. How do I delete that? Uh, let's see. Like this. Thank you. You have to delete, to delete it. Well, it says. Well, that should be the right invite. There we uh, go. That one's correct. Maybe. <laughs> Tor uh, can yep. do it. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe not. I feel like I should be able to delete it. You but... should be able to delete your own. I don't know. Yep. Welcome to the, I'm not sure how Discord, yeah. uh, how Twitch chat works. So, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> don't know. Anyways, for BRBN, yeah. I am the TGI Torquemada. Yep. That is the one and only I'm... Skittles. Yep. With her Tyro Fam shirt, rocking yes. it. Love and the one and only Natasha Lore. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Bye.